Okay. Welcome to the first annual, hopefully, Vintage Computer Festival Midwest. I'm Patrick Finnegan. I'm supposedly the organizer. The, the event is being co-sponsored by Purdue's branch of the IEEE Computer Society, their student club on campus. We're grateful for them helping and uh, helping us get cheaper accommodations here. Uh, we're going to have two speaker, three speakers this morning. We have a late edition. Uh, the first one is Ethan Dix. He is going to be talking about uh, computing at the bottom of the world. He works part time, uh, part time being for a, a winter at a time down in Antarctica. And he's back and we'll be going back there sometime October. You, in October. And the uh, next speaker that we'll have will be Hans Franks. He's here all the way from Germany. He's going to be giving a brief talk about photographing computers. And our final speaker of the day is Ray Borel, who has been a member of the uh, commuter computer community here in Indiana for 20 years or so, I think. Something like that. Um, so we're going to get started. I'll give this off to Ethan. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Well, when, um, when people think of the South Pole, they think of the ice, they think of the cold, they think of you know, isolation, uh, the hardship. People don't usually think of the computers. I get asked questions all the time from school kids and from people who visit my website about what do you guys eat, what, how do you keep from going nuts for, for 10 months at a time when the sun just doesn't rise. And uh, the, um, the, the closest computer related question I ever usually get is, well, how do you get on the internet? And the answer to that is, is by satellite uh, part of the time because of the, the orbits of the satellites are such that uh, you can't see geosynchronous satellites between 80 degrees in either pole. So we have to use some old decayed satellites that are in bizarre orbits that occasionally pop over the horizon about a degree. But in, in, those, in those few hours a day, we, we do actually have decent, decent internet feed. But it wasn't always like that. When uh, after the heroic age of Antarctic exploration with Scott and Shackleton and all those, those greats, there really wasn't much of anything going on, just a few guys here and there through the 20s and 30s and, and, and 40s. But after World War II, as part of the Cold War uh, race, the United States uh, set up a station at the coast, McMurdo Station, and set a, a station at the pole in 1957 to, um, to, to, to reside there. And since they set up the station at pole, there's been a continuous American presence at the geographic South Pole. My involvement with the United States Antarctic Program started about 11 years ago when I got a job for the winter in McMurdo as the PC technician. I did a winter and then followed it with two summers. And for the last couple of years and for the next couple of years, I'm working for the University of Wisconsin, running their neutrino detector that's at the South Pole itself. It uses the, the ice as a detector medium, and there's dozens of computers up on the surface to, to read out uh, several hundred and soon to be several thousand optical sensors to watch for flashes of light as neutrinos interact with the ice. And the, um, the job I have now is very interesting, Look, looking for the application for it. I read the, the job posting on the Wis University of Wisconsin job board, and everything they wanted were things I'd been doing both at work and at home in my workshop basically since I was a teenager. It was, it's, it's the perfect job. Electronics, Unix, um, everything in between. The, um, um, the computing at South Pole really got its start about 20 years ago. Prior to that, it was pretty much all Navy radio teletypes and lots and lots of, of paper tape and, and RTTY traffic. And starting when the civilians began to come in and people wanted to have access to computers, um, ITT, Antarctic Services, was the contractor. I, it was a branch of ITT, the guys that make phones and make other electronic products. So they came in with a phone switch and wired the place for telephones and began providing computers to the program. And they upgraded to Zenith 286s sometime in the early 90s uh, through Navy procurement. And at, at that time, the network was you stuck a floppy in your parka pocket and hoped that it didn't freeze before you got to the next building where you might be able to print something out. And that was supplanted by a T1 network from building to building in town where they had CDUs and PDUs in, in, different, in different buildings to, to build a, a 
what, what effectively could be a metropolitan area network over a square mile using long haul equipment. But it was inexpensive and it worked, relatively inexpensive. And about 11 years ago, they wired the entire town of McMurdo with fiber, and they now have a, um, a fiber token ring all the way around town, and then Ethernet dropped off of that. Uh, when I say token ring, the FIDI, sorry. Um, and then uh, FIDI carrying Ethernet traffic. And over the years, as they keep replacing things, they, they've moved up. Now it's strictly an Ethernet and um, over fiber, no, uh, no FIDI. And, um, and um, for the business world, because there's a, there's a support contractor that changes from time to time. It was ITT Antarctic Services. It's currently Raytheon Polar Services Company. The contractor tends to be very business oriented. They provide services for, um, for the scientists under contract with the NSF. The services include um, dishwashers, bus drivers, IT personnel, office people, cooks, everything. And then the other side of the house is the science. And I've, I've worked on both sides. Currently, I'm working, working for a science group. And with their business attachments, they're, they're very Windows and Microsoft oriented, whereas the science community is very Linux and Unix and Mac oriented. So it provides for some interesting um, interface issues. Um, when I first came down in 1995, I was there for probably two weeks when somebody called me up and said, I can't print. So I wandered across town, found the building in, in a maze of buildings in, in, a, in a strange town, finally found the location, sure enough, the guy's a printer, hooked up to his local PC, everything's plugged in, everything's turned on, but he can't print. And I poke around, and I poke around, and I poke around, and can't get it to print. Everything else is working great, I can log on, I can do a variety of other things with the computer. And after about 20 minutes, the, the user says, well, maybe it has something to do with the smoke that came out of the computer. And I said, why don't you tell me about the smoke? Well, I was using my computer and smoke came out of it. Really? Wow. I think I've got to take this into the shop. And it was, a, it was an old Dell 316SX um, in an era when back in the United States, people were using 486s with 16 megs of RAM. This, the standard machine on your desk was a 386SX with two megs and a floppy drive and net boot over Novell. It was about three or four years behind the times. And that's a result of the, the supply chain to get things to Antarctica. You have to sort of order things one year. It sort of ships over the summer. And then when it arrives, it arrives right at the end of summer. You put it away and you come back the next fiscal year. So this basically, you buy it in fiscal year one and you get to use it in fiscal year three. So everything is horribly out of date. And this, uh, this particular 316SX, I cracked open the case and there's a 84 pin PLCC with a crater in it. So, yeah, that's why I can't print. And one of the things I was later, um, I got a, a very positive review on in terms of being able to use my classic computing skills was we ran out of spare parts. So I took that motherboard uh, removed the chip, found a different dead motherboard with a good parallel port chip, swapped them out, and my boss was astounded. Wow, you can do that? Yeah, you just take a soldering iron and a little solder wick and you move the chip. And it's like, wow, I've never seen anybody do that before. So the, um, the, the application of, of electronic skills is, is a very handy one to have, and, and my current boss is appreciative of it. We had a, um, a board for which there was exactly one spare, and rather than use the only spare we had, I traced it to the, the input uh, buffer somebody had fried, and uh, it was another surface mount chip. And fortunately, we had a few of those on hand and was able to fix that. But um, other fun things, um, one, of the, one of the things that I brought with me my first trip down that I, I haven't brought lately is I brought my Amiga 3000, and it was the third Amiga at, um, at McMurdo Station. It was, a, it, was a, it was a good year for that, and I don't think we've equaled it since. It's two 3000s and a 2000. And um, this is back in the wild, woolly days of, of, uh, of, um, of um, Mosaic and Netscape 0 0.9. And um, I got a hold of the uh, Amiga web server and put that up because at the time there were no rules about that. And I was at one point serving my pages from, the, from Antarctica. And uh, they, they now have rules about that to keep people from hammering the bandwidth that's, that's precious. But. Um, Towards the end of my first summer, I was talking to the South Pole Science Tech, and I, it's everybody's goal to go to the South Pole. If you get as close as McMurdo, it's only 800 miles more to go, but 10 times as many people can get to the coast as ever get the chance to go to the interior. And talking to the science tech when he was in town taking care of something, visiting us, he commented how, how, how poorly their Spark 5 was operating at the South Pole. And I said, really? Well, maybe I can help you with that. Well, what do you know about Sparks? I said, well, I have one at home. 
And he went, wow, you have a spark station at home? Well, sure, come on down and fix it. So that, that earned me a few days at the South Pole to help fix their, uh, their Spark 5's OS reinstall because somebody had horribly, horribly botched something. And with a taste of the South Pole, I knew I had to come back. And a few years later, I got the opportunity to working for the university to get to spend a winter at the South Pole. And it, it's just been great. Um, the, uh, the project we have depends on Linux for almost everything. But there's one really ancient little piece. We've got uh, a quantity of VME crates that have data collection boards and a PowerPC, 200 megahertz PowerPC VME board running LinksOS, which is just like Unix, only smaller. So everything you're used to, all the flags for LS, all the flags for PS, some of them are there, some of them aren't. And it just makes it entertaining to go, oh yeah, this doesn't have that. It's kind of like you know, th getting thrown back to the, the V7 days of all, all the, the features that have been added between now and then. And um, in addition to uh, keeping, the, um, keeping all the experiments working, um, there's a lot of free time in the winter. We had a really good winter where the experiment stayed up 98% of the time, which since I didn't have to fix things, left me a lot of hobby time. And uh, I figured it would be the case, so I, I uh, prepared in advance and sent down a quantity of electronic parts and managed to scavenge a few things here and there from dead telephones and dead radios. And I'll just go through a little bit of, of the things that I built at the South Pole. Uh, one of the boards I brought down is an INS73, uh, sorry, INS8073 single board. This is the uh, basic on a chip, uh, SCMP microprocessor based chip from National that uh, appears in machines like the RB5X robot. <coughs> if you just literally, the reference design is you hang a, uh, an SRAM off of it, a couple of diodes and a clock and a level shifter and you have a computer and you, you talk to it with a, with, a, with a dumb terminal and it runs basic natively as far as you can tell. And um, I spent a few weeks completely reverse engineering it because I couldn't find schematics on the web. Just about the time that I finished it, I found the original vendor. He was still in business, and he sent me scans of the manual the same week I finished documenting the board. But in the meantime, um, since its interface is pretty much just um, a, um, a series of pins off of a 8255 PPI and then a variety of... Uh, status lines and so on from the, the chip itself, I built myself a um, just a little breakout board and a sort of a mounting stand, including scavenging parts off of uh, dead CD-ROM drives to, uh, to, uh, to fix things up because, well, one of the problems with being at the South Pole for the winter is it's, there are no flights between effectively uh, Valentine's Day and Halloween. So whatever you have on hand is all you've got for eight months. And I started to clone the board just because I have a few of the chips on my own. But unfortunately, I didn't get very far before the sun came up and it was time to actually get back to serious work and get the station ready for the new guys who were coming in a few weeks. The, um, what's next? Ah, this one. I've been wanting to build one of these for years. One of the machines I built as a kid was a, a Quest Elf. Bought the, bought the bare board and bought all the parts when I was in high school and put it together. But I'd always wanted to have a popular electronics elf. So during the summer, I'd made arrangements to get all the parts down and spent the better part of April in my spare time putting it together on a point-to-point -point design. And with only one wiring mistake, it worked the first time. And the best part was um, when I brought it home and was able to hook it up to a monochrome monitor, the, the Pixie video worked the first time, and that was, that was a great thrill. And all the parts are still available. If anybody ever ever gets an interest in an elf, it can be yours. The um, oops, wrong side. If anybody has been to the Spare Time Gizmo site, this is a uh, this is one of Bob Armstrong's designs. It's this, the SBC 6120 based on the 6120 12-bit microprocessor. And this was one I sent down just as a bag of parts and assembled at the South Pole over the winter. It, it's my spare, the, uh, the primary one, which I sent down pre-made along with the I.O. board 6120 from Jim Kearney um, and the front panel for also from Bob. What I made at the South Pole was the, uh, the frame. When I started, this was a piece of 2 by 4 in the scrap bin. And they have a full carpentry shop there, so I was able to fashion a, a reasonable enclosure for it. The last thing to show off is Mike Riley's um, Micro Elf. 
This is another one. Unfortunately, because of shipping delays, I didn't get the board until sunrise, and uh, actually a month after sunrise when the new crew came in, but it was the last thing I made before I left. It's a, it's a, a 32 K byte um, elf with um, extra uh, address displays that the original design doesn't have, and an expansion port that the original doesn't have, so you can hook on things like uh, a disk interface or um, external video or, or things like that. So, as, uh, as Pat mentioned, I'm about to go back in October, and I'm still trying to figure out what I need to, what I need to take down with me. I'm also working on things like uh, an ELF 2K um, that I'm finishing up on. I've got the disk board to assemble and a few other things, but I know based on the previous winter that it's going to be a good diversion to have a few things like this to get to put together and, uh, and assemble kits. One of the guys there asked me, what, what, what does it do? And after a while of trying to come up with an explanation that somebody who isn't interested in these things, finally he said, oh, it's like building ships in bottles. And I said, yes, it's just like building ships in bottles. It doesn't have to do anything. Just, just the act of building it is, 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 is where the enjoyment is. And then the nice thing is if you want to do something with it, run adventure on a 12-bit computer, you can. But for me at least, I've been building kits since I was a kid. Just, just the construction is a pleasure. So um, at this point, um, I guess, um, hmm. I guess it'd be a good time for questions. I'm kind of out of prepared material. If anybody wants to ask anything, it'll probably trigger, trigger a story here and there. Do you take donations? Do I take donations? Um, well, I do. It's possible to mail things to the South Pole during the summer. I mean, I, I wouldn't want somebody to try to mail, you know, like a PDP-1134. It's a bit heavy, but, uh, <laughs> you know, small, mm, small things wouldn't, wouldn't be terrible. What did you have in mind? Um, I don't know that I'd necessarily want to want to have to deal with shipping an Amiga both ways. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm not at the South Pole, I'm in Columbus, so I don't know, I don't know where you're based, but um, I'm, I'm, yeah. Sorry, I keep forgetting it's in Columbus, Indiana. Um, but yeah, the, um, yeah we, we, we can talk. Anybody else? Uh, not so many. I'm a ham, um, but the the with the the growth of the internet, the use, interest in ham radio has declined substantially. And uh, in fact, in McMurdo, I th I'm not sure that they have a 12-month uh, out of the year ham shack operating. South Pole, it's all under the dome currently, and I don't know as they're decommissioning all those buildings as they go from the the 1970s station under the dome to the new station that they're still finishing. Um, I know that there, there is, of course, a comms area, but I don't know what it has in terms of, uh, of, of ham radio sorts of equipment. Um, the, um, um, it, it is a shame because the, um, the Internet is not universally reliable. It's even worse when you're at the bottom of a multiple thousand-mile satellite link. Uh, we get everything from, um, uh, for instance, this, this month is a particular time of the year when the GOES-3 satellite, one of the ones we use, happens to be eclipsed by the Earth as it goes around the back side. The geometry is just right that there's a, about a 90-minute dark window, and the satellite is so old, they don't want to run the batteries too far down, so they turn off the transmitters during the, um, during the, uh, the eclipse phase. So we have this notch in our daily activity where they just, no, nope, we're not going to use it right now, shut it off. And there's other, we've had other problems. Last year, the 9-meter dish, the elevation screw broke two days into winter. And they, after a few weeks of fiddling around, they f f managed to find a way to prop things up using uh, three-quarter inch all thread and angle bracket so that they could at least sort of wiggle it back and forth a little bit and they were able to take um, no pass out of four hours and at least get a couple of hours of low bandwidth pass. So even with all these things happening over and over again, they still seem to feel that, that ham radio is, is unimportant. And the other problem we have, though, is that they use a lot of HF communications, but it's all on military frequencies. So we can't use the regular day-to-day -day stuff because hams can't access those frequencies. Sorry, all the what? Um, there is at South Pole an old compact 386 that happens to be on our TTY. It was actually used last year because nothing else was working. It, it was during our 12-hour 12, 12 
a dark interval for the internet, and Iridium wasn't working properly, so they had to fire up the RTTY and use it. But it's a it's a PC version of the old stuff. But it's it's still installed and it, it got used in the last 12 months. And so hopefully they'll consider moving it or something that replaces it into the new station because you can point to this and say, see, we needed this. It's one of the problems there is is that because the Antarctic Treaty specifies that everything you bring down has to be brought back, there's very much a mentality of when we're done using this, we have to put it in a box and get it out of here. And it's very hard to keep certain spares down there because they say, well, we haven't used one of these parts in, in oh, three years. It must be useless. And they, somebody else comes in, throws it in a box, and you come back looking for it. Oh, where did this go? We shipped it back. It was useless. But I need one. And, and I fought that a lot since um, a lot of people either in their experiments either just say, well, I guess we just don't get any more science this year or, well, we'll send one down next summer. Uh, my boss told me flat out, uptime is your most important goal since the nature of our experiment is unlike a regular telescope where you point it at some patch of the sky and say, I'm going to take readings from 1 to 2 o'clock today. If you have to fix the telescope, well, I guess I'm going to take readings from 2 to 3 o'clock today. Ours is statistical in nature. It just sits there passively. You don't steer it. It's just embedded in the earth, embedded in the ice cap, and it waits passively for events to, to go by it. So if it's only up for four hours a day out of 24, there's a lot of events you're going to miss. And especially considering that uh, of the 100,000, I'm sorry, out of the, out of the 8 million events a day that it picks up, we're looking for two or three. So if you're down for eight hours, you probably missed one. And um, spare parts is an important, uh, important aspect of, of keeping it working. It's uh, 15 racks of analog hardware. Um, there's CAMAC crates, there's VME crates, there's, um, there's uh, high voltage generators, f five of them, each, each one the size of an RLO2 disk drive. You see one upstairs, you can get a comparison that, that, that inject high voltage into the ice. There's, uh, there's several crates uh, that do high voltage, uh, that separate the signal out of the high voltage line that goes down. So it's, uh, spares are important. So uh, you mentioned that you had some amoebas down there? In 1995, we had three amoebas down there. Oh, okay. So I was going to say, what do you use them for? Uh, they were personal machines people had shipped down. It was uh, just, just on the cusp. Like I, said, like I said, the standard machine of its day was if you just needed to, do, to get access to the station, Applications like uh, Fox Pro and 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 um, DaVinci Email and uh, use the Novell Network. The um, the standard machine you got put on your desk was a two two megabyte 386 SX. If you were a manager and you needed Windows, you got a four megabyte 46. And again, you know, it, it's hard to put it in perspective, but. Um, this is when the Pentium really hit it big back in the States. People were getting Pentiums left and right, and we were still using 386SXs for 80% of the population. But, uh, and that's why several of us looked at what was available and said, you know, I've got something better in my closet that I'm going to bring down. How much personal equipment are you allowed? The, um, when you come in, if you're a winter over, you get an extra bag and you get an extra baggage allowance. If you're just there for a few weeks or a few months in the summer, you get 70 pounds total, and that includes whatever gear they issue you to keep yourself warm that you're not wearing at the time. If you're going to be a winter over, they double that to 140 pounds, but they also give you more gear. So instead of one parka, you get two. Instead of one pair of eight-pound boots, you get two pair, and so on. And um, so you really effectively only get about an extra 30 pounds of, of effective weight. but um, both Southpole and McMurdo are at the other end of the military APO system. So you can mail yourself things. And it's pretty much within limits as much as you care to mail yourself. The real issue is as packages arrive in the, in the system, there's only so many airplanes taking them down. Mail is the absolute bottom priority. And if you send yourself something after Christmas, you'll probably get it, but you might not because they just stop sending mail at a certain point. You know, small things, envelopes, um, letters, those, those all get through. But parcel mail, I mean, if you want to send a parcel the size of this podium, you better send it in October, and you'll probably get it by January. So you really have to, to have some foresight on, on shipping yourself large items. This is 
How successful? Uh, well, quite successful, um, enough that um, the, the current detector that's been in place starting in 1996 through they stopped, they finished installing it in 2000 or 2001, before I worked for the project, um, they spent about $20 million on it to basically more or less prove, yes, we can do it this way, and it was successful enough to, to win a $280 million grant from the government to go build the bigger one. So it was, it was successful enough to get more money. And so right now we're like two or three years into a 10-year cycle to build the new one, which is all, um, it's based on FPGAs and ARM microprocessors where each sensor ball has a photomultiplier tube and several circuit boards, including an arm in every, in every ball. And there's uh, 4,800 of them buried a mile or more down and several hundred more scattered on the surface. So it's basically a 5,000 computer sensor network that all talk up through uh, digital serial cables that carry DC voltage down to power things and carry data back up on the same wires, and then several hundred computers on the surface to set set values, collect timestamps, and, and run the detector. They, they're, they're turning a two-story dormitory into the, uh, the, the computer room for the top of this detector. And no windows. It's all, it's What's the role of that? It's a telescope. It's a, it's a neutrino telescope. It's, if, if, if you can imagine, it's like looking in a different color of light. I mean, neutrinos aren't photons, but just like as you, as you go from optical telescopes to radio astronomy to infrared to x-rays and so on, every time we look at the universe in a new kind of light, we see things we never even imagined were there. And neutrinos are, are yet another kind of energy we can use. Um, they're, they're even better than photons in a lot of cases because neutrinos, since they pass right through solid matter, they go right through dust clouds, they aren't attenuated, they aren't deflected by, um, by uh, magnet magnetic or electrical fields, they punch right through stars. So as far as the universe is concerned, it's completely transparent to neutrinos. There's a variety of, 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 of specific scientific questions they're trying to answer with this. I mean, things like, what is dark matter? What is the origin of dark matter? What are gamma ray bursts? Does they, they have a site already in is it, uh, northern United States? There are several sites. Uh, if you're thinking of the one in Minnesota, that's a, a very small detector that, among other things, was used to, um, I think they shot a beam of neutrinos from Fermilab in Chicago, and they use this detector basically to, to catch it. And it really wasn't meant to be an astronomical instrument as, as much as a, as a raw science, raw physics instrument. And when, when it was in a cave north, I think it's west there, way west. Yeah. And they're like, that was in a cave, they were using water to begin with. Right, right. You, you, you need some detection medium. The, fir the very first neutrino detector, well, the neutrino was basically the result of rounding error resolution 70 years ago. Um, Wolfgang Pauli basically looked at, looked at some equations about the, the combinations of protons and neutrons and, and all the masses and energies and said, I have this crumb left over. There must be a particle that, that's created during this reaction, but we'll never be able to find it because it's, it's massless and it's chargeless and, and it won't interact with us. And I think the quote is, uh, my friends, I have, uh, I have done a terrible thing. I have postulated a particle that cannot possibly be detected. And it took uh, decades until someone was able to build a detector. The very first one was chemical in nature. The, a, a group filled a swimming pool at a university with dry cleaning fluid and put an argon sniffer over the top so that when a neutrino would hit a chlorine atom, the collision would turn the chlorine into argon and it would escape and the sniffer would catch it. And it caught one argon atom per day. Proving that neutrinos exist because nothing else would, would have this exact effect. And um, in the case of the South Pole, in case of Amanda and now Ice Cube, the, um, as I said, there's about 100 events a second that the, the, the detector picks up. The, um, the, um, the, bas the, the basic one is atmospheric muons created by cosmic rays travel just far enough into the ice to be detected. We don't want to see those. Those happen all the time. We're, we're being showered with them constantly. What we want to find is neutrinos. And so as long as we can reverse the trajectory of where the particle came from and we can show that it came through the Earth, there's only one thing that can do that, and that's a neutrino. So every, every particle's path we trace back, if it's from the northern hemisphere, since we're at the top of the southern hemisphere, if it's from the northern hemisphere, it has to be a neutrino. And it's sort of like Surratt's pointillistic paintings, where you sort of make a painting out of lots of little tiny dots. You know, on, on Thursday, here's two dots. Friday, ooh, we got four dots. On Saturday, we got two dots again. 
And over time, you can sort of fill in a picture of the sky based on, well, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. But at, at two or three a day, it takes a long time to make a picture of anything. I remember scientists up in Montana or wherever it is in the cave, they were using, I guess it was water, but you know, yeah. heavy water. Yeah. And they switched it to some sort of oil eventually. Because you uh, the cave with that. Right. And like, I don't know how far below the surface it is, but it's quite a ways. Yeah. And they were just um, uh, trying to catch the neutrinos from that point. Yeah, there's different places that they're lo locating, and that's what you're doing. South Pole. Right. We're, we're, our, making, a making a different, uh, taking a different look at the universe. universe in a right. Way. Right. And and there, there's there's neutrino detectors. Uh, they're they're working on one that's going to be in the Mediterranean. It's, use, it's using seawater as the detector medium. We're using ice. And there's there's different pluses and minuses. One of the things they have to worry about is 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 um, potassium forty is radioactive and produces a visible flash of light to the detector. So they have to realize that sometimes what they're going to see is is potassium breakdowns, and we don't have that because there is no potassium radioactive potassium in South Pole ice. So, any, any other questions? Let's see what I can come up with here. I've got a little bit of time left. Um, whew, um, uh, well. It was, it was the machine I, I used every day for, for, for writing software, for getting on the internet. For it was, it was my own personal machine that I brought down for me to use. So that was your purpose that time. Right. Right. It, it, was, it was the machine I used every day at home, and, and it's the machine. In fact, I even kept up. I had I set up a – I'd been using UUCP to collect news and mail on it, and I continued that in, in McMurdo by setting up a UUCP tunnel over the Telsier device and effectively changing the old phone number when I was on an ISP at home on, on, on dial-up to the IP address of the machine. And as far as the application was concerned in UUCP, it just says, I open the serial port, I send a phone number to it, and I get packets. And the difference was it went out the Ethernet card and up through the satellite link instead of going over an analog phone line. But I, I continued to get my, my actual mail on that machine over um, you know, over a, a twenty thousand mile link. And what do you use now? Uh, um, Linux. Linux. Yeah, I got a I got a old beater laptop in there. So if, if I if I freeze the screen or if I drop it, it's 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 annoying, but it's not a catastrophe. And um, we also have Linux machines everywhere. For uh, we do the science community does for for our own use. So. And uh, I, I did, did, did do one interesting thing on on um, on the Linux machine was uh, I ran a, uh, um, a copy of um, um, what, what's the name of it? It's um, it's the PDP10 emulator. That's um, is it TS10 MU? It's one of those uh, with the what's called the Panda distribution of of TOPS20. So that basically I had a virtual 36-bit machine running on a 32-bit machine, including network interface and. Um, it, it's a great platform for running the original version of Zork. <laughs> Since w one of my hobby projects is, um, is I ported the original code from um, MIT, the, the muddle code, to inform so people could play original Dungeon, original Zork, on, on everything from Palm Pilots to Commodore 64s to, to modern machines. And that's actually something I did at South Paul last year that, that's not harder related as I, as I after how many years? Six, five years? Six years? Came out with a, a, a bug fix release of uh, Z Dungeon, and I was using the PDP10 version side by side with my version to make sure that that everything I did was bug for bug compatible. Um, any any other questions? Um, well. Uh, I think I've pretty much um, been through it all. Uh, Pat, is, is Hans here, or? Um, okay, still upstairs. Well, let's see, what can I, what can I fill time with? Okay. Well, did you wanna say a few things, or about, about the day, or? Okay. Well, thank you very much.